Okay. Let's get started. All right. So what we're trying to do today is get through um, the review of quadratic program of an SVM um, and talk about some structure that that exposes about the problem and ultimately discuss uh, the idea of using kernels uh, in the dual and finally finish up with multi-class SVMs. Um, and that will be it for the for the SVM lectures. Okay. Uh, so one thing I want to mention is that just like you know, just stepping back and just like nearest neighbor was sort of the vanilla technique that you would apply if you knew about machine learning, SVMs over the last two decades have become the de facto workhorse of uh, machine learning problem application. Right. So anytime you want to do classification, if you've heard a little bit about SVMs or if you've heard a little bit about machine learning, the first thing you would try out in boxes in SVM. It's one of the reasons why that's the case is you know there. As we'll see today, the problems are nice and complex. They're very well studied. There are standard implementation packages for that. You, know, you just download libsvm and it works out of the box. It gives you something reasonable performance, even if you know nothing about the problem, even if you know nothing about what a quadratic program is. It will just, it will just work. Um, and that often leads to like reasonable baselines that you can start to then improve by doing other more sophisticated things. Okay. Um, all right, so let's let's get started with that. So what I want to do today is uh, start from where we left off last time on uh, Lagrangian duality and derive an SVM duality. The general problem was minimize some f of w such that g of w with some inequality constraints and some equality constraints. Right, that's the most general problem, and what we wrote down for an SVM was this. Right, so minimize weight vector v of w transpose w such that y i W transpose xi plus v is going to be equal to one. Okay. We, you know, we've done various things about this. We interpreted this as, you know, this is a hard margin. The one is a one is sort of the margin indicator. This is sort of a score. The score of the positive class should be greater than plus one. The score of the negative class should be less than plus, minus one. So this is a linearly separable hard margin case where this is getting you perfect classification on training data, and this is minimizing the norm, which is maximizing the margin. Okay. The point here today is let's compare that to the general case. Okay, we have a function that's with, that we're minimizing. The variable here is, there are two variables, w and v. There is only an inequality constraint. We do not have an inequality constraint. Right? Um, so the last time we said you introduce a Lagrange multiplier, which becomes a variable in the dual, one for every constraint. So it was an alpha here and a beta here. Right? So this is actually for all i. So there's one such constraint for every data point. So this will be alpha i for this constraint. We don't have any equality constraints here. Okay. And we have written down a Lagrangian <coughs> alpha beta, which is just f of w plus alpha g w plus beta of and that Lagrangian here would be a function of W, B, those are the primal variables, and alpha i's. There's alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, all the way to alpha n, and that would become half W transpose W plus summation i equals 1 to i, 1 minus. I just converted the greater than equal to into a less than equal to. That's why there's the one minus, and then there's an alpha, which is the multiplier. And that's just just paralleling this step, right? 
we talked about this game interpretation that uh, in the primal objective, in the primal one, you want this to be less than or equal to zero. Alpha, you can think of it as a penalty. So if this is if this is not less than or equal to zero, then you have to pay a penalty of alpha. And in the dual program, you also get a reward if you underperform your budget. So we've just written this thing here. We know that the dual function, so the dual function of alpha comma beta, we have written as well, just perform the min over the Lagrangian of the primal variables. So let's just perform this min, and you know this is sort of the this is where the game theoretic view comes in. Uh, how well, like, what does your primal player do as you manipulate the norms? Right? So alpha and beta are the two uh, penalties or norms here, and you and you have the primal player minimizing for every setting of the norms. And so that's what you we would do here as well. Uh, in order to perform this minimization, one thing that must be true is at least this has to be true. Right? This is a minimization of this Lagrangian function, and that's why you wrote down at the argmin, the following <coughs> condition has to be true. Let's write that condition down here. So we have to perform two uh, gradients. There are two primal variables. This has to be equal to zero. And this has to be zero. It's two primal variables. Okay. I'll do one of them, and that's the other one I'll do there, but it's actually pretty easy. So this is where the standard calculus stuff. Every term, let's start differentiating. Right? There's one of the w's that pops out. Uh, no w here, so the term that, that needs to cure is this is just Greek vector transpose, alpha, and this is the term that will be left. Right? So plus summation i, alpha i, negative y i, x i transpose. And that has to be equal to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so pretty quickly we're able to get a relationship out. So the weight vector has to be equal to the summation of alpha i, y i, x. And that's that's interesting. So the weight vector is summed over all every every single data point. Well, for the dual multiplier times the class, which is plus one, minus one. So this is all scalar and this is a vector. So this is telling you that whatever weight vector you're going to end up learning has to be a linear combination of your training data. So you could be living in some 10,000 dimensional space, but there's, if there's only 10 points, then this is only a linear combination of those 10 things. Right? So your, your weight vector is only spanning whatever subspace that your training data is in. Does that make sense? It's sort of nice. It's, it's fairly intuitive. It makes sense. Can't actually go into a direction that you never saw any data. Okay, so that was one. The other thing we do that here is we wrote down the Lagrangian with respect to P has to be equal to zero. And okay, no term here depends on B. This doesn't depend on B. This doesn't depend on B. There's only one term here that you get anything. It's Yi times alpha. So that's pretty easy. So we just get summation of alpha i, Yi equals zero. Okay, it, this is basically just providing a constraint on the types of dual variables that you can get. Right? This is just saying, uh, so the dual variables, so there's going to be a plus one for the positive classes, negative one for the, for the negative classes, and some of them are summed to zero. Just a simple constraint on the dual variables. That make sense? <coughs> okay. And we know that if we can plug <coughs> these, so this is what we know about the W and B, the primal variables here that minimize this thing, right? So we can actually plug those back in into, to get this function. So we need a function, which is the dual function, in which case here it would be LD of just alpha i. Right? We need this function. And we can do that by going back to the Lagrangian, which is this expression, and plugging in what we know about W, and plugging in what we know about V, 
into this expression. And that way we would get a dual function. Does that make sense? OK. It's actually not that difficult to do that. Is this sign. By the way, this was one of the KKD conditions from last time. There was one other KKD condition which was of interest, right? It was the alpha star g of w star equals 0. Before I raised the general setting, this was the other KKT condition that we written down. It was called complementary slackness. Either your constraint has to be tight, so in the sense that either G of W has to be exactly equal to zero. If not, if that is not true, the dual multiplier has to be zero. Right? One of those two things has to be the case. And in our case, we're going to it's going to lead to an interesting interpretation of this constraint and that dual multiplier. In a second, it will turn out to be quite interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to raise this side and I'm going to write down the dual and objective function. All right. So I'm going to take this thing right here and I'm going to plug in my the dual function of alpha one to alpha n. Right, there's n of the dual variables. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say half of w star transpose w, so the optimal w that we write there, minus or plus summation of alpha i, 1 minus w star transpose x i, plus b and b star. So I'm sort of plug, in, plug in the expressions for that. OK, that's pretty easy. So there's a half here. W star is just summation of alpha i, y i, x i, right? This w we know is exactly this. So I just have to do that a couple of times. Alpha j, y j, x j. Right? This transpose this is just this transpose that. The weight vector is written as a summation of alpha i's, y's. That's the same thing as it. Plus. The first term is summation of alpha. <coughs> That's just this term right here. There is a term here, which is the third term, which is minus summation of alpha i, y i, x i transpose w star. And I can replace w star by summation of j, alpha j, y j. Final term, which is this one, which is minus summation of alpha i, y i, b star, and we know this thing, since b is a constant, this thing goes to zero. That is a constraint. Okay. One term here, second term, third term, fourth term, and that's why I've written out four things, and I've plugged in what w star is, and I've plugged in the relationship between the alphas that they have to satisfy. This is, about, this is the same as this, right? There's half of summation of alpha i, y, x i transpose alpha j, y j, x j, and that's the same thing here as well. Alpha i, y, x i transpose alpha j, y j, x j. So this half minus one just leads to a minus half, right? And I can, I can ignore this term right here. And so those are the only two terms that survive. Ends up being quite a simple expression if you stare at it for a couple of seconds. It's sum over alpha i, the first term, the linear term, minus one half summation over i, summation over j, alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, x i in a product with x2. Does that make sense? And I can write that even more simpler as alpha vector transpose 1 <coughs> minus half alpha vector times a matrix times another alpha vector. Right, 
So I can, this is i, j, so this is all pairs of i, j of alphas, and this is just some term that multiplies it. <coughs> Getting there. We're slowly getting there. We're just cleaning it up. Because the cleaned up form is far more interesting. This is a linear part in alpha. This is a quadratic part in alpha. And here's a quadratic multiplier. Right? And I can call this as my matrix Hij. Right? It's just a number. Hij, alpha i, alpha j. And that's what this thing is doing. So Hij is equal to yi yj, xi, Let's construct a matrix. This matrix is of the size n by n. It's the number of training data points by number of training data points, and every entry in it is, just take the classes, multiply those, take the inner product of features, multiply those, and that's the number here. That's the quadratic part, this is the linear part. Okay. Uh, pop quiz, time to sort of wake up. Is this a... What, what sort of an optimization problem is this? So, actually, let me just quadratic. Thank you, quadratic program. So, excellent. That was a primal. Can I raise something here so that we can write down the dual in a clean up form? Yeah, there's a constraint. Alpha i, y i equals zero. Anything else? I'm forgetting it. Uh, r by i should be uh, non negative. Non negative, thank you. It's a dual multiplier to an equality constraint, and therefore it has to be non negative. Okay. Let's just do like simple counting things. How many variables in this optimization problem? In the primal? D plus one. How many constraints? N. N. How many variables here? N. N. Exactly. How many constraints? N. Two. Two N. Every single constraint here <coughs> becomes a variable here, and therefore the number, <coughs> number of variables here is equal to the number of constraints here. So there's, and it's not two N. It's a, it's n plus one. There's n of these constraints. This is for all i, but there's only one of this constraint. That's the difficult constraint. These are all easy constraints. This is just positivity. That's the one that's that's difficult. Okay. Uh, is the primal a, a quadratic, quadratic program? The answers are yes and no. Yes. The primal is a quadratic program. Yeah. Like, so there are linear constraints in W and V. There is a quadratic objective. Mm -hmm. Is the dual a quadratic program? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a quadratic program in alpha. So here's the quadratic part. Here's the linear part. And there's a, there are linear constraints. Mm -hmm. Is the primal convex? How do you measure convexity? It has to have linear inequality constraints. Sure, that's true. Convexity of a quadratic objective is given by? Semi, that positive. Yeah, positive semi definite positive. of something. <laughs> something has to be positive semi definite. What yeah. has to be positive semi definite? There's yeah, something called a Hessian. A Hessian matrix. Yes. You have to take the derivative of this <laughs> twice. Identity. identity, excellent. So identity. So that's positive semi definite. So this is a convex QP. This is a maximization. So if this was concave, this would be a convex QP as well. So is this concave? Have you checked for concavity? Negative of convex. Negative of convex, okay. So that's the linear part, that doesn't matter. If, if h is positive semi definite, then it's a convex. Excellent. Is h positive semi definite? Yes. Depends on h. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't depend on h. Well, for this h, it is always positive semi definite. Why? Oh, it's positive. Oh, it's 
It's squared of things. It's squared of things, excellent. So there's, here's a little trick, right? H is a matrix. So you can think of this matrix as I can make, I can express it as a transpose of two other matrices. A long, generally, a long thin matrix and a short fat matrix. So put, put your data xi on each row here and on each column here, xj. Right? And it's not just xi, it's yi times xi, yj times xi. So if your class if your feature, if your class is positive, put the actual data points. If the class is negative, put the negative of the feature vectors. On the rows here, on the columns here, this is a matrix A, this is A transpose. <coughs> we know that anytime you can express a matrix as A, A transpose, it's always positive semi definite. Why? Because if you take a, what variable should I use? Z. So, oh, maybe, yeah, Z. Z of H. Z, if this is always greater than zero, then H is positive semi-definite, right? Mm -hmm. And Z of A transpose A Z is the norm of A Z. And that's all this thing. So if you can take a matrix and you can write it as an inner product of two other matrices, then that will become the norm of a vector and therefore, you know, the Z transpose Z will always be greater than zero, and that's the definition of positive semi -definitions. So because of this QP, the way this dual program was constructed, this is always going to be positive semi-definite. This is always going to be concave. And so this part is always going to be convex, negative, so it's always concave, and so you can maximize it. OK, excellent. So we did a bunch of math, which started with a convex QP, ended with a convex QP. Why do we do it? So if the first problem was solvable, you just open up MATLAB, you say quad draw, <coughs> you feed it a matrix. The first problem was solvable, the second problem would always be solved, also be solvable. So why did we do this? If n is small, this is easier. If n is small, this is easier. Mm -hmm. Sure, but usually n isn't the one that's small, right? Yeah. A million points. Mm -hmm. Because the equality constraint is better than equality. Maybe because equality constraint is better than inequality. Why? Lucky guess. <laughs> Any others? Why do we do this? You can solve both. Yeah, you can check it. Interesting. So if you can come up with primal dual methods, that's you getting into optimization, right? As a machine learning person, why do we care? Our optimization friends are constantly telling us that if some problem is convex, we can solve it. So then why should we care if it's the primal or the dual? Constraints are easy. Constraints are easy. There's only really one constraint here. Right? Yeah, there's one hard constraint here versus there's a bunch of constraints here. Okay. So there, these guys are really getting into the optimization thing. It turns out <laughs> that it turns out that this is a nearly unconstrained problem. This is just a positive alternate constraint, right? There's only one constraint here in this problem. If, if there was no constraint, if there were no constraints in this, we know how to solve quadratic programs. So just take the first derivative and set it equal to zero. And it turns out that for a nearly unconstrained problem, you can expose the structure. You can write down an optimization algorithm that uses the fact that there's only one constraint. Uh, it's called, you know, it was proposed in 90 something, it's called sequential minimal <coughs> optimization for solving the dual of a convex QP. And I think you will implement it, or at least I'm trying to. To get it to but it's actually a really easy algorithm for, for solving the dual QP, which is much faster than generic algorithms for solving generic QP. Okay, but that's them being uh, funny about optimization. Why should, as a machine learning person, why should we care? Any other guesses? Okay, so the number one reason you should care is because it builds character. This is a good thing to do. <laughs> Writing out duals builds character. That's the number one reason why you should care. The, the slightly more practical reason of why you should care is this primal dual structure exposes uh, something about your problem that isn't immediately obvious by just staring at the problem. 
For example, we already derived that this is true. Right? That's us writing down the Lagrangian, taking the gradient. We didn't know by looking at this primal structure that our, our weight vector is a linear combination of our data points. There's something else that you can derive that's true, which is we looked at something called complementary slack slackness, right? So alpha star of G, of G of W star has to be equal to zero. In this case, alpha I of G I, right? Because there's a bunch of constraints. So alpha i star, and what is gi? It says 1 minus yi of w transpose xi plus b, so w star, b star, has to be equal to 0. And we already told you some hints about this. So let's assume you solve the dual QP, and you come up with an alpha i star that is strictly greater than 0. It says for the 10th point, the alpha i star is some value like 5.3, strictly greater than 0. What does that tell you about that constraint? Exactly. This constraint has to be equal to 0, which means this value has to be equal to 1. We know that it was supposed to be greater than equal to 1, but this is actually saying that it actually has to be equal to 1. When are things equal to 1? On the margin. On the, on the margin, excellent. So there's, there's some line, there are two margins. And you have a point that's actually lying on the margin. Right? That's what that is saying. So if I can solve the dual, I just have to check the dual variables. If they are, all I can say is that if they are greater than zero, then the point must lie on the margin. Right? What, what if they are equal to zero? What if alpha i star is equal to zero? You can't say not on the margin. Because the product of two numbers being zero, you can't say if the other one is zero or not. It could still be on the margin. No. Right? Well, it's not as important. In some sense, it's not as important. <laughs> Why? Because if you stare at this expression, it's saying take a linear combination weighted by alpha. So if alpha is equal to 0, it doesn't matter. It's not going to contribute to the linear combination. So this summation is not over the entire data set. This summation is over support vectors. Right? Support vectors are the points that lie on the, on the margin. And we're actually, in this case, only interested in the ones that have dual multipliers greater than zero. So this is, like, this is a mathematically precise way of saying that no other training data point matters. Like we, we, had, we had intuitively said that, that you know, there's a geometry, there's a line, there are points. We know that only the points, we, you know, we are trying to argue that it's only the points that lie on the margin that matter. It can be a point, it can be a negative point here, it can be a positive point here. You could change this a little, and it's not going to change the margin. But this is... This is a precise way of saying that, that they're never going to matter. Because their dual multipliers will be zero, and they will never contribute anything to them. Does that make sense? And that's something that was exposed because of this structure, because of looking at the dual. Does that make sense? OK. The third thing that's important in this case is if you stare at the QP, and if you stare at the definition of is the definition of h. The definition of h, which was h i j equals y i y j x i transpose x i. <coughs> this doesn't have x. This has x here. The only place where data shows up, x is the data, y are the labels, right? The only place where data shows up is in inner products. Right? It never shows up by itself. So if I could somehow manipulate your data to keep the inner products the same, you would solve the same optimization problem. Right? Does that make sense? And if I could compute inner products for you through some other function, you could still solve this QP. Nothing would have changed as far as you know. If instead of xi transpose xj, I introduce some my special function k of xi comma xj, right? and I just plug that in here, create a matrix for you, you can still solve this QP and get the same solution. And that's the key idea of kernels. And that's what we'll look at next. OK. Ah, we never talked about
about the bias. Yeah, so the bias, we never talked about how to get to the bias. We gave you a constraint. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see, do I want to get into that? You can get to the bias, right? You know that, you know that things that lie on the margin satisfy <coughs> this with an equality. So if you've sol solved for, for W star, uh, so we only give you an expression for W, right? So if you solve the dual, you can plug this expression in and get the W out. But you also know that if alpha is positive for a point, then this satisfies with equality. So if you know W, you can also solve for the bias. Right? Does that make sense? So you find the support vectors, which have alpha greater than zero. You know what that W for them is, and you because this is an equality, you can extract. Does that make sense? Let's take a minute here so you can you know, take all this. Let's let's take our break early. Let's stop here for a second. So there were a couple of questions I want to make sure everybody got. Um, so the thing about B, you can extract. So what we said was we mathematically wrote down the primal. It corresponds to this dual. And actually, we I didn't I realized I didn't explicitly say it. But last time, we talked about something called duality gap. You solve the primal, you get a P star. You solve the dual, you get a D star, which is a dual optimal solution. Turns out, in this case, the duality gap is 0. So solving the dual is mathematically equivalent to solving the primal because the primal here is uh, is convex and it satisfies something that we didn't tell you about, which is called the Slater's condition. 
But because of those reasons, whether you solve this or this, the value, the p star that you get from this mu, is will be the same as the max, the d star of this of this dual. Does that make sense? So mathematically they're equivalent. Computationally, it will often be faster to solve this, and therefore you will solve the dual. And then from the alpha stars that your QP solver gives you, you will try to recover what W and B star should be. The way to do that will be through this expression to get W, and you find the support vectors where it will be an equality. You plug in the, the W star, and that will give you a, a one-dimensional sort of a relation for B. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so this was all hard margin SVM. Let's we now talk about the soft margin as well. Okay. So this is what we've been talking about, and we derived, we wrote down the Lagrangian, took the derivative, plugged it in, right? So uh, the Lagrangian was had this form, we took the derivative, plugged it back, back into this, got a, got a dual QP, and this is, uh, we know how to solve this dual QP. Um, in the non-separable case, or the, the linearly non-separable case, where we introduce slack, so you don't want the constraint to be satisfied exactly, you can allow some slack. The objective function <coughs> is different and the constraints are different, and so the cons there will still be an alpha multiplier for every constraint, but now there's there's twice that many constraints, right? So you'll also need to have a beta multiplier for one of these constraints. You'll still write down the Lagrangian, still take the, the derivative, set it equal to zero. And it turns out that it leads to an extremely similar looking, where do we go? Oh, I skipped one. Uh, no. uh, yes, oh, okay, it was this line. So it leads to an extremely similar looking dual, which is, the objective is exactly the same. Right? So alpha i's are sitting here in that linear. This is the quadratic. The objective is identical. The only place that matters is before alpha i's were positive, now they get an upper bound than c. That's, it's not intuitive to see why this happens. You actually have to take the, take the gradients and set it equal to 0 and derive the dual, and you actually get this form. But if I were to come to you, come to you with this, it makes sense. It sort of smells right. This has to be the right thing to do because it behaves correctly. If I set c to infinity, that means alphas do not have any constraint. Right? There is no upper bound. And c to infinity was the same thing as a hard margin as well. Mm -hmm. right? So if I, in the primal, I set c to infinity, you are not tolerating any violations in the constraint. That is what a hard margin as well is. In the dual, that just means there are no constraints on alpha. Right? And this also gives you a nice sort of intuition about when you are penalizing for slacks or penalizing for violations, in the dual you're sort of expanding the space. Right? So as you penalize more, you, you allow more and more alphas. Does that make sense? Searching over the larger space. What happens if you set c to zero? Alphas will be zero. Exactly. Alphas will be zero. W is summation of alpha times yi, right? That's the thing that we derived. And so the weight vector will be zero. That's the same thing that we looked at from the primal perspective. So setting, not caring about the violations, right? So it means the weight vector that will be optimal is the zero weight vector. Notice that uh, if you try to map this to the logistic regression form, that's the regularizer, that's the loss, and here the multiplier is on the loss. Usually we've been writing multipliers on the regularizer. So in your midterm, for example, you were asked what happens if I set the multiplier on the regularizer to infinity. So you get zero. Okay, so it has this nice sort of interpretation of caring more about margins expands or restricts the space of alphas in a high degree. Each alpha has an upper bound and you can sort of you care more, you allow more alphas, you can sort of try to construct whatever it can. If you care less, it will allow less. Okay. Um, so this was the non-separable case. Uh, and we talked about you know, why did we learn about the dual SVM. One, so number one builds character, exposes some structure, there are quadratic programming algorithms that can solve the dual faster. And finally, the sort of most 
Um, so we are getting to uh, allowing for something called a kernel trick, right? Allowing kernels in the game. Um, just to show you visually again, there is this idea of, of sparsity, the fact that uh, most, so alphas, the zero alphas um, correspond to things, so non-zero alphas correspond to things that lie on the margin, exactly. Non-zero alphas correspond to things that lie on the margin, so only those points matter. And it, it'll turn out that when you actually solve your QP, uh, the number of alphas that are non-zero will typically be much smaller than the total number of training data. Um, and it will depend on C. If you allow for an extremely large C, then there'll be a lot more alphas that are possible, which will be easier. Okay, uh, so we have that. Uh, now let's go to the, the idea of kernel trick. So we, we wrote down this as our dual. We know that the dual only depends on the data as inner products. So what if I plug in some arbitrary function? If I plug in some arbitrary function in place of that inner product. So I can still con construct this matrix and I can still solve this QP. The only thing that sort of I need to satisfy is that this arbitrary function better be some inner product in some space. Why do I need to satisfy that? So just keep it positive. Keep it positive, definitely, exactly. So that's one intuition for that. Um, that if I cannot write it this way, if, this, if I cannot write it as inner product in some space, then I'll end up with a matrix that could be uh, could be you know indeterminate, and so I will not be able to solve that QP. That's sort of one computational way of thinking about it. The, the connection is much deeper. Okay, so let me show you by example uh, what this could what this could mean. So we'll do an example of a particular type of kernel. Okay. Each number here is yi, yj, xi plus plus xj. Okay, uh, and what I'm claiming to do is instead of constructing this matrix with xi, xj, I will construct it with some arbitrary function which I'm calling a kernel function. Mathematically, also sometimes called a Mercer kernel. xi comma xj. Takes two vectors, gives you a number. Right. <coughs> All this usually is clear of any goods. So intuitively you should think of a kernel function as some function that measures similarity. How similar are these two vectors? Here's the simplest kernel function, xi transpose it. Right? This is often uh, also called the linear kernel. If this number is high, it means xi and xj are roughly pointing in the same direction, they're of high magnitude, blah, blah, blah. Right? So this, if they are orthogonal, this number will be small, so they're less similar. This is one way of measuring similarity. What happens if we do that? If we plug it in here, we get our original SVM problem. Right? That's a linear SVM. Here's another kernel. I can do this, right? I can just take in a product and square it. What would that mean? What does that correspond to? Here's one way of looking at it. So let me not say xi, xj, because I'm going to use a lot of subscripts. Let me say u and v. That's going to be quite easier. And this is u transpose v. And let's say u and v belong to some d dimensional space. It should be a real number. Oh, sorry. Yes, it should be a real number. Thank you. OK. Um, what does this mean? I can write this as summation of i going from 1 through d of ui vi squared. Right. 
think about what that would expand to if I only had two terms, right? If this was, if d was two, it'd be u1 v1 plus u2 v2 squared. So there would be u1 v1 squared plus u2 v2 squared plus 2 v1. Right? What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to say that this is actually equal to summation of, so there's, it'll be u1 v1 squared plus blah 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 till u v v d squared plus there will be a 2 v1 v1 times u2 v2 right? plus all possible pair of x common. Does that make sense? I'm just expanding it out. u1 v1 squared, u2 v2 squared, u d v d squared and all pair of x combinations, twice of those. I can write this as inner product of two different vectors. Right? This, this square I can write as inner product of two different vectors. You see what kind of vectors? So what I can do is I can define the first vector as, so here's what we're thinking about. This is summation over i, summation over j of ui vi times uj vj, right, with some constants multiplied. I can group all the u terms first and the v terms <coughs> first. So I can say this is u1 u times u1 all the way to ud times ud and then square root of 2 u1 u2 all the way to square roots of u v minus 1 to v. Does this make sense? So this is all possible monomials of degree 2. So u is a d-dimensional vector. This is all d choose two terms right here, and this is you know all the linear terms. U1, u1 times u1, ud times ud. I just plug all of them up. And if I take the dot product of, I've written it the wrong way. So if I take the dot product of this vector with this vector, I would get that sequence. So I would have v1 times v1 all the way to vd times vd square root of two of v v minus one. Does this make sense? So inner product of these two vectors leads to this summation. Why do we care? The reason why we care is this thing is a linear kernel in some space. Right? So this is phi of u transpose phi of v. There is some feature map that takes in a vector and augments, creates new dimensions. So this, this was some quantity that you measured. You measured some results from some sensor, right? Outputs of something. So these are your features. And what this thing is doing is it's creating new features. You take each pair of dimensions and multiply them together and you get new features, right? And linear in that feature space is the same as quadratic in this original feature space. Does that make sense? So you can, if you've plugged this in here, you can still solve this QP you will still learn a w vector, a corresponding w vector, vector and it will be linear in this new space, but it will be quadratic in the original space. And so this is that idea of a, of a kernel or using a kernel machine, which is that we can project our data into a higher dimensional space, learn linear classifiers in that higher dimensional space, which correspond to non-linear classifiers in our original space. Computationally, let's look at this. So how many steps do I need to perform this? the order d, d squared, d cubed, 2 to the d. There's d of these summations. And there's, I can square it in just a single step, right? That's an elementary operation. So this is order d. Excellent. And this is order d squared. Right? The feature map is of a length d squared. It's d choose 2 plus d. Right? So this, this inner product takes me order d squared steps. Does that make sense? So if we were actually to project our data into a higher dimensional space and then take inner products, it would be slower than if we can identify its corresponding low dimensional kernel. Does that make sense? So this is where the speed of kernels comes in. In fact, this was a particular function. This, was, this is called the polynomial kernel of degree two. You can define polynomial kernels of degree three, four, five, whatever. You can, you can do operations, right? What if I make this 3, 5, or some degree m? 
This thing blows up. This becomes order d to the n, but this does not. Like the fact that this number is growing does not change. It's no, no, no slower for you to do is to square something than to cube it. So you can actually learn extremely high dimensional things computationally in the same time. Does that make sense? In fact, and you're going to, either you're going to show it on a homework or an exam. I forget which one. <laughs> but you're going to show that there are kernel functions. They're not dot product kernels. Like they're, not, they're not this polynomial kernels. There are some other functions that actually correspond to a feature map which is infinite dimensional. Right? This, this inner product is then some infinite sequence, right? It's phi i and phi j. There's some infinite, infinitely long sequence that actually converges to the value of this. Right? So you can know, you can project your data into an infinite dimensional space, learn a linear classifier in that infinite dimensional space without with spending finite time, without spending infinite time. And never explicitly storing infinitely many parameters. Right? Does that make sense? You see that again. So, <laughs> let me say it again. This is a particular kernel. I can actually give you another kernel. It's actually a pretty easy kernel. It says e to the negative of u r mu minus e distance squared. Right? This, is, this is Gaussian kernel or RBF kernel. e to the negative of distance squared. So if two things are really far apart, this will smoothly decay. Right? So it's a similarity function. If two things are identical, that will give you a high similarity. Right? Satisfies all the things. It can also be represented as inner product in some high dimensional space. That high dimensional space is infinitely dimension, infinite dimensions. So you can you can you can take so phi is then a function that goes from d to r infinity and summation of phi i of u times phi j of d. And i going from 1 to infinity is, a, is an infinite sequence that actually converges to k of u comma, where k is that. So it converges to e to the negative of u minus k. So, does that make sense? There exists a phi such that this will be true. If you were to project your data into an infinite dimensional space, you could never actually learn a w transpose by a few. Right? You could never do this. There would have to be infinitely many parameters. But you don't need to do that because you just need to define a kernel matrix and the only parameters that can possibly ever exist are these alphas. There's one parameter for every data point and so the number of parameters is equal to the number of data points and not the infinite dimensionality that you could project really right. Does this make sense? Okay. At a high level. <laughs> kind of makes sense. At least this is pretty concrete, right? Polynomial kernel, we can actually write down an explicit kernel map. Like this is called a kernel map or a, or, a, or a feature map. It's taking your low dimensional data into some high dimensional data. Linear products, dot products in that high dimensional space are exactly what this thing is doing. Yes? I mean, don't you usually want to reduce your dimensionality? <laughs> yes. <laughs> when do you increase dimensionality? When do you reduce dimensionality? So. If you are already overfitting, right, you would not want to use kernels. And this is, a, this is extremely important to know. This is why you want to know if you are in the high bias case or the high variance case. Right? Are we overfitting or are we underfitting? If you've used a linear classifier and you seem to be underfitting, then you want to use kernels, because kernels correspond to a high dimensional embedding of, of, your, of your data. If you're already fit, overfitting in U, Right? If this is your original feature space and you're already fitting, overfitting in this, you do not want to use it. Or at least what you want to do is you want to do dimensionality reduction on you and then maybe use it. Further. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so how can we construct a high dimensional classifier based on this? Using kernel. Using this kernel? And then what's the next step? So the, the next step, so the, the, it's actually pretty simple, right? The next step is I give you some data, right? x, i, x, j. You just compute k of x i x j. Right? You just do e to the negative. Mm -hmm. You plug that value in here in this matrix. Mm -hmm. right? So you, you make an n by n matrix. You feed it into a QP solver. It gives you an alpha. Right? So at this point, you can solve the dual QP. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
And this is equal to projecting data in high dimensional space. Exactly. And solving this dual QP is the same thing as projecting your data into infinite dimensional space or a high dimensional space and solving the, that primal QP. So you never actually solve the primal QP, but it is equivalent. It's the same thing. In fact, I mean, this is what you're doing in homework three. You will initially implement this for a linear kernel, and then you'll swap the kernel in and out for other kernel functions. And if you've written a dual solver, then there is no change to your code. Because all that will change is the H matrix. Any other questions? Uh, when the number of features are high, then uh, using this kernel, is it computationally very expensive? When the number of features, so when the, when the input feature dimensionality D is already high, then using kernels is expensive. So it's only order D, right? Because every kernel, you can, not every kernel, so the kernels that we're <coughs> we define dot product and e to the negative of u, y minus, u minus v squared, the, the time it takes is only order D. The time it takes into the, in the higher dimensional space is order infinity. You can't do it. Okay. Uh, so in fact, uh, so just like I defined a quadratic kernel, so u transpose v squared, you can define u transpose v raised to power m. And then the feature map that that corresponds to is all possible monomials of degree m. Right? So you do uh, u1, u2, u3, all the way to um, and this is just one entry in your vector, and you have to have all possible such entries. So it's, it's an extremely high dimensional space that you're projecting into. You're going from a lower D to a capital dimensional, so a higher D, and the dimensionality is given by this expression. Don't worry, this is just a standard combinatorics thing, but how many monomials, how many, if I give you uh, D numbers, how many ways can you get monomials of, of subsets of size M, right? And that's given by that expression. The thing that, that's important is that expression grows extremely quickly, right? So on the x-axis is D, the input dimension. So if you, whether you're measuring one-dimensional data, two-dimensional data, three-dimensional data, and the curves correspond to whether you're trying to use, trying to project it into a high-dimensional space with second-order polynomial, third-order polynomial, so fourth-order polynomial. It's already fourth-order polynomial, 10 dimensions, it's going to something like 700. <clears throat> it essentially corresponds to learning a 700-dimensional linear class plot. And it grows, so if you want to do, if you measure 100 things about your input, you want to use a sixth order polynomial, it corresponds to about 1.6 billion times. It grows extremely quickly. But it doesn't matter, because the number of parameters in your dual QP is not growing. The number of parameters is still n, the number of training variables. And in some sense, the reason why this happens is because we know w is equal to summation of alpha i, y i, and phi of whatever representation. Right? So you cannot go out of the linear subspace of your training data. OK, uh, there are many kernels that are often used. And so this is sort of like the free parameter, if you will. This is, this is model selection. right? Just like there is polynomial regression, there is classification with polynomial kernels. Right? So you can do a kernel of degree d. So u transpose v raised to some degree, and I apologize, I'm switching from m to d, but forgive me for that. Right? So there's of some degree, and this corresponds to a high dimensional space where everything is, or you are taking monomials of degree d. If you just add a 1, it becomes up to degree d. So it adds everything from degree 1, degree 2, degree 3, all the way up to, up to m or d. There are other kernels, for example, it's called the Gaussian kernel or the radius ba radial basis kernel, which is exponent of negative of the distance, right, of L2 distance squared. And there's some bandwidth parameter that controls how quickly that, that falls. And you can have sort of tan edge kernels and other sort of sigmoid type kernels as well. If you download, so for example, uh, linear, so libSPM, it has already built-in support for all of these things, right? You can specify what type of kernel you want. And then the hyperparameter that you're choosing is either the degree of this polynomial or the bandwidth parameter. Or, you know, or the model selection, which kernel should I use? And that choice you probably do in a validation set. Does that make sense? And in terms of model selection, if you think about using this kernel, degree one corresponds to a linear classifier. Right? Degree two contains a linear classifier and it is a special case. 
Just like in polynomial regression, you could set some weights to zero, and it contains in it other special cases. So these are nested classes. So on training data, you're going to get performance better and better. Error is going to go down. But you'll have to check on validation data. That makes sense. So here's, here's a quick demo about that. Exactly. This is not linearly separable, right? This is one class. Uh, let me actually check this. Okay. This is one class. This is another class. This is not linearly separable. If I use a linear kernel, and if I say go ahead perform, can I get this? Okay, excellent. So you know, it gets. It's uh, this is an online algorithm. You guys are implementing a batch algorithm. We haven't talked about what algorithm, right? So this is the this is some algorithm that I can. It's an iterative algorithm. This is the sort of the best it can do. Uh, and the circles are the sort of support vectors. Right? But I can use, for example, a polynomial kernel. I can use a polynomial kernel of degree two, and now it corresponds to linear in a quadratic space. So this was x1 and x2, right? I can project it to a high dimensional space. Um, but So it's linear in that space, but you see this curve here. So it's learning a sort of polynomial decision boundary in this original space. So this is an even harsher setup of that. So you can, you can see that it does actually learn something is definitely not, not linear in this case, right? So this is learning a nice little quadratic decision boundary in the original space, corresponds to linear in some uh, high dimensional space, and here are the uh, support vectors that it picks up. And you can do, so this is, this is all polynomial, you can increase it, but here's another data set. So here's another data set, right? So this is in two dimensional space, I can see some nice clumps here, but there's no linear thing that will separate this, there's no quadratic thing that will separate this. But RBF will actually rise to the equation and separate everything, right? So it's RBF can learn a decision boundary like that. In this case, it ends up using a lot of support vectors, like everything on this decision boundary, like near this. So this is not a support vector, but a bunch of these things are actually support vectors. We can learn an extremely complicated decision boundary, um, because, but it's still linear in some infinite dimensional space. And the way it's doing it, if you think about it, it has access to e to the negative of distances. Right? 2D distances in this 2D sense give it a good idea of which way you should lie on the on the on the of the classification model. Yes. Well, what is R B F stand for? Sorry, radial basis function. Function. Okay. Uh, it's the same Gaussian e to the negative of distance squared by some bandwidth parameter. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is what the decision model looks like. And you couldn't do this, for example, with a linear code. Mm -hmm. You'd sort of have some sort of best fit that is trying to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Interestingly, if you, if you think about this, this sort of a behavior is very similar to what a near neighbor classifier would also do. Because it's also based on distances. You look at your neighbor's distances, do a majority vote, and you could learn that if you had enough data in the nearest neighbor classifier. And that's sort of telling you that an RBF, because it has access to pairwise relationships, is basically trying to extract that information. That makes sense? Okay. And there's there's a way to make this relationship precise. You can try to get to like 
uh, you know, try to have play around with a bandwidth parameter, and you can try to see that you know the, the only distance that will survive is the one of the nearest neighbor, and then you can try to tweak and see does and you know all these geometry type arguments, dual QPs, kernels, does this actually collapse to a nearest neighbor classifier? You can you can make it collapse to a nearest neighbor classifier. Can you show sigmoid kernel? Can I show sigmoid kernel? I can show it. I don't know what it does. Uh, <laughs> so it's just it's a kernel that takes dot product, passes it through a tangent, and we'll talk about this close to the linear. Close to the linear, but this thing is it is on linear. We will talk about this more when we get to neural networks, which use a lot of the sigmoid and the tangent. Okay. Uh, can you just make polynomial over linear where it doesn't really change the because I, I know there are there are a few things that aren't coming up here to the degree of the polynomial. So I'm just trying to change that to see what's going on. Anyway, okay. Uh, all right. In the time we have left, let's try to get through this. Um, all right. So mathematically, uh, what type of kernels can we use? Uh, so any particular function that takes input space to input space gives you a real number. Think of it as a similarity. Uh, is fine. Mathematically, we need something called a positive semi-definite kernel, or it's also called a Mercer kernel. Often, or in the SPM literature, people don't write Mercer, people don't write positive semi-definite, they just say, I use this kernel. They are, they are really talking about positive semi-definite kernels. And positive semi-definite kernels or functions are basically uh, these functions. So they're functions where you take any possible data set, any, so it's a function, right? It's a function of x, i, and uh, function on u and v. You take, you sample that function at any possible places, so any possible data set, and it has to be a positive semi-definite matrix. Right? So if I, this is, this is a function that can be defined over any input, but no matter what data set I sample, I will always get a positive, this relationship will always work. So that's what a positive semi-definite function is, and this is really hard to prove or disprove. Like when you come up with a function, you realize that this has to hold true for all all data set samples. That that's often hard to prove that this would be the case. So people don't often usually construct kernels from ground up. They sort of there are some things that we know are kernels, and they'll sort of play around with those and construct those. So the most common way of actually proving that something is a kernel is you sh you explicitly construct a feature map and you show that every uh, every kernel value can be written as inner product of some feature map. If you can do this this is a positive semi-definite function. Right? It will always lead to a positive semi-definite matrix no matter what data set you set. This is often hard, but it's possible. Right? So what's often easier is uh, if you, and this is, I'm giving way too many um, It also should be symmetric, right? Yeah, it should be symmetric, right. So there's a couple of like, uh, this, is, this is the hardest constraint that you have to look for. What's often easier is oftentimes if you know that there's an exponent of a negative thing and if you know the Taylor series of the exponent, if there's an infinite series and you think about what, what series would I need to multiply these two things and it will converge to this number, and that's usually how you sort of explicitly construct a, a feature map. So that's, that's often what's done. Explicitly construct a feature map so that you can show that it's always a kernel map. Um, exponent of negative distances are always kernel. And this is something that you can, people often use. So, if if you are if you write some down some distance function that satisfies metric uh, constraints, then this will always be a kernel. So it can be any arbitrary distance, L1, L2, whatever you want to use. And linear combination of kernels are also yeah, not linear, but uh, positive combinations of of kernels are also kernel. So you can take K1, you can take K2, and some uh, K1 plus K2 is a kernel, uh, and K1 times K2 is also a kernel. So you can compose kernels from other kernels. Right. So finally, sort of uh, to to sort of do all this math and try to get to the kernel trick is basically using a Mercer kernel or a kernel function without explicitly knowing what feature map or you know, without caring about what feature map it corresponds to. You just have to know that this thing is a Mercer kernel. Therefore, some phi exists. I don't know and I don't care what that phi is, but I can still solve this theory. Here's a particular question that, uh, oh yeah. So there are um, sometimes domain, uh, certain mm -hmm. domains like computer vision um, and even text, the features you extract are often histograms. 
And in histograms, so like bag of words, for example, it's just counting how many how many times did I see this word, right, over some dictionary. Uh, in computer vision, you oftentimes look at a histogram of color intensities or textures. Right? So X is a histogram. Uh, there are there are natural definitions of distances that are better, not distances, but kernels that are defined for histogram type things. So this is called um, uh, an intersection kernel, or, a, or a also often called a min kernel. So you look at every single bin. So U and V are two two histograms, and you look at every bin and you try to count what is the common part of these bins. Right? So I have a I have some histogram. I have another histogram in every bin. What is the least? What is the common part of these? And you sum that. That gives you a good sense of similarity. And that you can show is a, is a particular thing. Here's a question that uh, is often interesting. Um, let's say you solve a duel, and at test time, you need to make a prediction. So a new data point comes in, and you need to be able to do this, right? You need to, you need to be able to do W transpose pi of x plus b and look at it. That's the score. And you need to be able to say this is plus 1 or minus 1. And you guys don't get to give the answer to this question because this is a common question that I ask in my lab. But everybody else, how do you do this if phi is an infinite dimensional feature type? I said some nice magic. I said, you know, we can always define in the dual everything was appearing as xi transpose xj, so you can always compute k, some function. I tell you Gaussian kernel. Great, you can solve, you can train an SVM. How do you make a prediction with that? Infinite, like infinite Phi is infinite dimension, yes. Lower the dimension? <laughs> lower the dimension. <laughs> so infinite dimensional RAMs don't exist as far as I know. You will never be able to store this in memory. Uh, how, do, how can we possibly do a dimensionality reduction with infinite dimensions? So I'll give you a hint. So there's a W transpose phi of x. So there is a notion of inner product. W is infinite dimensional, mm -hmm. phi is infinite dimensional. Can we do that inner product? Do you look at the highest polynomial? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transform back to a kernel form. Transform back to the kernel form, excellent. How do we do that? Start from the, from the expression of W. From the expression of W, excellent. So here's, here's something to keep in mind. We know W was equal to summation of alpha i, y i, phi of x i. Right, so for the entire training data point, for the entire training data set, map every training data point to this infinite dimensional space, and the linear combination of that will be an infinite dimensional W. Right? What you're being asked to do is W transpose phi of x j, so new x, right? Can we do that? Come on. Excellent. So this is just summation of alpha i, y i. It's the kernel of x i comma x. <coughs> x b, and then check the sign of that. So in order to make a prediction, every time at test time you need to make a prediction, you need to scan over your training data, compute its similarity to every single training data point, and then sum up and that's your score of this test point. And you need to check the sign of that score plus some scalar B bias. Does that make sense? So this is what you need to do at test time. So if you ever train a linear SVM or train a uh, you know, RBF SVM, a linear SVM is storing an explicit W. You can do a W transpose X really quickly, but an RBF cannot store a W. The W would correspond to an infinite dimensional feature map. Or in some cases, you would not know what that feature map is. And so you have to write this for loop, or internally, that's what libSVM is writing. It's going over the entire data set, and it's computing kernels, and it's adding them. So just testing will be slow. Testing is order n. Is it really order n? It's based on the number of support vectors. Excellent. So the summation is not over every single training data point. It's only over the support vectors. Mm -hmm. So the more support vectors you have, the slower it gets to testing. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so turns out that you can actually use this idea of kernels in other uh, classifiers, like logistic regression. Right? So we know logistic regression, uh, we can always take x to some higher dimensional space and write a logistic regression function of this one. Probably if y equals 1, given x comma w, I can always write this, right? Uh, but in addition to this, I can define w as, you know, if this idea of using linear combination of training data as weight vector, I can sort of write that in a logistic aggressor and make sure that I get summation of kernel values in this expression. So I can I can use I can make this a kernel uh, logistic regression. This is doing logistic regression in a high dimensional space because it's only using this inner products here. And you can sort of um, you can do parameters. Now the parameters are alphas, not w's. We've just written w as a summation of alpha values, some feature. There was actually a, there was actually a period, especially in the 90s and the early 2000s, where you know a whole bunch of you know this this idea of a kernel trick was realized. Came out of the SVM literature, but it's like we can do kernel logistic regression, we can do kernel d squares, we can do kernel PCA, mm -hmm. and so there was this like last <laughs> <laughs> and kernelizer. Right? And we'll, we'll talk about this, especially in the PCA lecture. It's extremely odd to do kernel PCA because PCA is a dimensionality reduction space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> reduction so what does it mean? It means that first you take your data, embed it into an infinite dimensional space or a high dimensional space, and then you do dimensional, linear dimensionality reduction in that space. So go up then down, and that's going to lead to a better sort of dimensionality reduction. So linear dimensionality reduction in some high dimensional space is going to work. We'll talk about that. Uh, let me let me stop here but, because we're out of time. But next time we'll talk about just this one thing, which is how do we handle multiple classes? Because everything that we've mentioned so far is binary SVM. We talk about other SVM generalizations to prove multiple classes.